Dan to the pledge. Gene, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Victor, would you lead us in prayer, please? Yes. God in heaven, we thank you for this evening that you've given to us. We thank you for everybody that's here. We thank you for the things that you've put in place and the people that you've put in place. God, we thank you for your order. We ask that you will guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, roll call, please. Councilor Howard? Here. Councilor Lorenz? Here. Councilor Watson? Here. Mayor Pertem Segola? Here. Mayor Becker? Here. A quorum is declared. No, no, modification to the agenda? Uh, yes, sir. We have one modification to the agenda. We'd like to continue I-1, the public hearing for the new liquor license for the family dollar store to the February 15th council meeting. They um, have a few things that they would still need to complete. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded uh, to continue I-1 to February 15th council meeting. The licensed liquor... L liquor license renew <clears throat> licenses and liquor renewal public hearing for new liquor license for family dollar is in there any more discussion you need a councilor howard yes councilor lorenz aye councilor watson aye mayor program Sibilla? aye mayor becker aye motion carries to modify the agenda continuing i1 to the February 15th, council meeting. Okay, approval of consent agenda, the minutes of regular meeting from January 18th, 2024, and the review and approval of accounts payable. Mm -hmm. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda for the minutes of regular meeting from January 18th, 2024, and the review and approval of accounts payable. Is there any more discussion? You need a Councillor Howard? Aye. Councillor Lorenz? Aye. Councillor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sibilla? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve the consent agenda. Proclamation, communications, and appointments. Appoint Councillor Howard as the city liaison to planning and zoning. So the reason why this is back on the agenda is because I misspoke last time and said that um, uh, it was a mayor mayoral appointment, and it's not. It's actually a city council vote to appoint a council member to serve as a non-voting member of the planning and zoning committee. We we'll need a motion to appoint. Yeah. I make a motion to appoint Councilor Howard to as a councilor liaison to the planning zoning committee. Second. It's been moved and seconded to appoint Councilor Howard as a council liaison to planning and zoning. <clears throat> Is there any more discussion? That's something we actually want to do. I submitted my pocket proposals. He was volun volun appointed. That's what I was gonna say. It's like volunteer or did you volunteer? We asked for you need a <laughs> Councillor Lorenz. Aye. Councillor Watson. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sibilla. Aye. Mayor Becker. Aye. Councillor Howard will not vote on this. And I abstain. Well Danny, I would abstain. <laughs> no. <laughs> and reappoint Damian Ariano and Justin Pepper to the planning and zoning. Is that why you're up here? Yep. So this is more housekeeping. So they, they're not quite done with their term yet. However, everybody basically was set to leave the planning and zoning commission within four months of each other. So this will make it so that we have two members for the next two years. And then next year, we'll do the three remaining members. So we have a good rotation as opposed to possibly losing the entire planning and zoning commission at the same time. Um, so they both agreed to sign back on for another two years. 
you guys would like to reappoint them. They've been doing a great job. Um, they're heavily involved in the land, uh, land use revision. So, but yeah, that's why it's on there is just for housekeeping to get them reappointed for two years. Yeah, I'd make a motion to reappoint Demi and Ariano and Justin Cover to the planning and zoning board. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yours. Been moved and seconded. <laughs> Can we appoint Damian Ariano and Justin Tarper to the Planning and Zoning Commission? Is there any more discussion? You need a Councillor Howard? Yes. Councillor Lorenz? Aye. Councillor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to reappoint Damian Ariano and Justin Tepper to the Planning and Zoning for two years. Okay, we'll move, we'll move to citizen comments and special presentations. Uh, citizen comments, City Council welcome to your unscheduled comments. Please uh, limit your comments to three minutes and Council will not take action at this same meeting. Okay, we will move on to scheduled appearances. <clears throat> In order to be on this portion of the agenda, you have to fill out the appropriate paperwork with the city clerk no later than noon on Monday prior to the meeting. Discussion on whether to do a water tap for our annexation at 603 North County Road 1. So um, some, some events took place today. Um, we have a gentleman that at that residence that's having problems with their wells. And this is becoming more and more of a problem. Our code says that in order for us to provide city water or sewer, they need to annex. These are properties just outside the city right of way. Um, so he was looking to annex, and I needed to come to you because you have to approve that and have him start the annexation process. Um, today, he, he informed me that he doesn't have one. He needs to go ahead and go forward. So they're not going to do anything at this time. They're going to try to find some additional funding to see if they can come on because their well is dying and they're too close to the city system. To their, to, so I, I think DJ and I kind of need, our code is very clear that in order to do water and sewer, they have to annex. Um, but it, I need a little direction from council as to what you want us to do. If you want us to force the annexations, or if you want to consider doing certain properties without annexing. But DJ, the code is very specific that it has to be annexed. So part of the annexation process is paying fees. Um, they have to do a plat map showing the property and the annexation and then have it come in probably in a neighborhood of $3,000. Plus they pay the tap fees for the water and sewer. So all in all, they're probably gonna be involved about $10,000 per water or sewer tap. Mm -hmm. so. so really of the 10 grand of annexation, what, three? Not the tap, how much is the actual annexation? 1,000. Pardon? 1,100. 1,100. That's the fee. Yeah. And then the, the rest survey and all of the stuff that goes with it. Yeah. So that's the other the survey is going to cost money. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. 3000 $4,000 and just the annexation process. Right. Plus caps. Correct. Plus 10, more or less 10 grand. It's, it's under 10, but it's right under 10. How long the process is that long? The annexation process can take a couple of months to get through, depending on how fast they work on their side. But it has to go through planning and zoning, it has to come in front of, they have to do a series of meetings, they have to meet all the, the checklist, and then it comes in front of this council. And they're already on the city server, right? That's it. Yeah, look, if you get a little bit of frames, sure. So they're already on city sewer though. We just need to tap. It's what no, he's a, he's he's not on any water or sewer. Okay, because he's still septic and well. He's still septic and his well is failing, and we're having we're having more and more. 
So we have another person that's struggling with their well over there by Brower Shippers, and then we have another one on the other side of town that's struggling off of Sickles and don't have water and sewer. But they, you say they, <clears throat> even for the taps, they maybe they don't have the money for that? They don't have the money for that. And then our rates for outside of city limits are double. So the $2,000 water tap for three quarter inch is 4,000 and everything's double. Their monthly bills are double. <laughs> well, yeah, and if we go through the we go through annexation, then the tap and long term, right? Makes sense. So, right. is there a way to group some of these people together to, to help push an annex through to where we can that's dissolve some of that cost? But we're getting a group of them at the same time. Or? There's really not unless they want to go to their because they're all in different places. Yeah, they're there. all in different places, and it's not like it's everybody's having failures at the exact same time. It's been kind of going on. And when we give them the fees, they're like, oh, we can't do that. So, but there again, they'd be looking at drawing a new well anyway. Right. And they can't legally draw a new well because they won't be able to distance themselves far enough from the old well. So it's one of those things. It's, Just leave it the way it is. That's tough. That's really tough. If we open that floodgate, I'm just saying, okay, we'll just leave it the way it is. I mean, what are you guys saying? Well, yeah. that's a tough floodgate to open because, well, I'm, well that's the whole reason. Down. The whole reason for having it, that you have to annex in it so we don't end up like pine and spruce. Yeah. And so there are all those of that live out there on Sherman. Yeah. Because yeah. all of them are outside the city limits. And they have no incentive to annex in at this point. No. And, and to be quite honest with council, um, residents, residential properties really just increase services. And don't really give a whole it's exactly back. we're not making a lot of income off that's yeah, just maintenance is what right. it is right the police force they have to do they're actually now yeah. we'll to those them. areas and they probably do already with you know yeah. mutual aid yeah. agreements yeah but it's it's now our it's our issue and stuff my husband leaves to them you know because it's like well, well i mean even if we drop something off of it we can only drop a very little of some zip. So, are there lines that are well, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's a smaller know, line that feeds. Yeah, I mean, this is on yeah. North Henderson, yeah. Yeah. going yeah. all the way out to the radio tower. And there's this orange line that is like way So, everything's in place. It is in place. They would just have to Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Public hearing for community development block grant. Do you have to say anything for this one since we're not swearing anyone in? Let's go ahead and call it. Okay. It's it's not sworn testimony in this case. So this is a public hearing, um, and the purpose of the public hearing is to present the community development block grant, um, the <clears throat> CBD CBDG, the CBDG application that we're already working on. Something you as council know about, we just wanted to make sure that we also inform the public um, on what we're working on. And let you guys, as well as the public, know what our intent and the process and our current status as of now. The public hearing is part of the process required for CDBG. Um, so that's why we're doing public hearing for this. The CBDG is authorized under the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974, Public Law 93 383, and is as amended under 42 U.S. Code. The CBDG program is money that is a non matching grant fund where the funds can be used multiple times as long as the project funded falls within the CBDG program guidance. And according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the CBDG program supports community development activities to build stronger, more resilient communities. Our intended project is designed specifically to meet those needs. At this time, it's our intent to apply for between three and four million um, for the acquisition of approximately 62 acres located in the Trosper Ranch Annex uh, to design a subdivision which can be developed in phases and install the infrastructure for phase one. Um, it's between three and four because initially I was going to ask for two and CBDG said, you can ask for more. 
I'm like, okay, but we'll ask for three. And it's like, you could ask for more. So we're just, they just keep telling us to ask for more. So once we figure out what that dollar amount looks like, I'll be able to tell us we're gonna ask for it. Uh, so with the acquisition of this land and combining with the land the city already owns, we'll be able to design a new 83 acre subdivision. This subdivision could potentially create approximately 400 housing units over the course of its various phases. These housing units will be split between apartments, townhomes, and single family residences uh, with both rental and ownership opportunities. These units will be considered affordable housing, which will benefit low to moderate income persons from 80 to 100% area median income or AMI. Even though you guys all know what those figures look like for the benefit of the people that don't, that means an income between $45,000 and $69,000 in San Luis Valley, according to the 2021 family or housing study. This project is important for our community because 60% of our homes are greater than 50 years old. The newest apartment complex inside the city was built in 1988. Uh, we are in need of missing middle housing where the average family in Monte Vista can purchase a new home. A high school graduate doesn't have to move to another city to find an apartment and we can have desirable housing options for our workforce. The largest obstacle facing creating new homes is the cost of infrastructure. While our need for housing in Monte Vista is great, the number is not large enough to entice a large developer. We simply don't have the unit count for them to be able to absorb the infrastructure cost and make the overall project profitable. By utilizing CBDG, we can lower the cost that the developer has to absorb and sell the property to developers over time using funds gained from this sale of the properties to install the uh, infrastructure for phase two and beyond. Uh, if by chance we are able to build out the entire subdivision, we have funds remaining, we can take and create a down payment assistance fund for the citizens of Monte Vista until those funds are exhausted. As long as we keep using the money in the same fashion for the CBDG program is authorized, we can keep using it over and over and over. Uh, so at this time, we're working through the application to ensure we provide the best possible application for the Department of Housing so that the approval process is painless. We've entered into verbal negotiations with your guys' approval uh, with the landowners. Currently, we're getting the appraisals completed before we make an offer. And then we are working through the environmental phase one, which is required for the CBDG program application. We're also working on the basic design, which we'll provide to you and planning zoning commission once we have a design where we want it. The intent is to provide a career suburb design, which will be walkable, have access to the SCAP trail, provide safe travel of streets, with traffic calming design features included as well. At this time, we're hoping to turn the application in in March and receive funds third or fourth quarter of 2024. Um, again, the true design with required engineering and construction as soon as feasible after that. So that's what I want to present to you today. And answer any questions. You're not looking for this. Actually, didn't we uh, authorize the city manager to sign in the grant last time? That one was already completed, so I'm not asking for any action at this time, just putting out the information and answering any questions and making sure that you guys, as well as the public, is informed. Sounds good to me. I have a question. Will this be a phased a phased approach and, and for how many years? Yes, so it'll be phased. I don't know how many phases yet. Um, we're designing phase one, um, and basically we plan on expending all of the funds we can to get as much infrastructure as we can in. Um, and then we're looking at somewhere between around 20 ish years for a total build out. Um, and the reason for that is we also don't want to flood the market with 400 new homes. They're not, our market can't absorb that. However, over the course of 20 years, we will be able to absorb the, that, that amount of housing. So we'll be splitting it up between multifamily townhomes and single family residences in each phase. Um, that way, each thing is available, but it doesn't kill them. Can any of the property be um, sold then for commercial development? None of the property that we're currently developing will have commercial zoning as it's planned. Um, Camp Bromhall Camp owns the mm -hmm. north 35-ish acres, um, which is all zoned commercial um, as the property owner. And he is not interested in selling at a price that I can afford inside CBDG. Um, so without him wanting to part with it, he has to put in his own infrastructure, do a subdivision plan, and get it approved through planning and zoning and through you guys. Um, so at this time, the commercial development is going to be kind of stagnant until we can figure out a way to either help or incentivize or 
find a way to get the infrastructure complete on the commercial side. One of the things I like about the way that we're doing this is if we own the property, we do the design, we have what we want. We don't have to worry about a developer purchasing it and then defaulting or taking you know, their time or wanting to not develop the way we want to be developed. This allows us a lot of control and um, allows us to make sure that we hire the right developer that fits our needs uh, and through a good process. So I'm really excited about this, this project. Thanks. Look Thanks. forward to more information. Thank you, DJ. Thanks. You have to close out the public hearing. Resolution. Uh, I'm out. Mr. Mayor, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and close out the public hearing. The record should reflect that this public hearing uh, occurred in the Monta Vista City Council Chambers starting at about 6.15 p.m. Uh, the entire council was present. The presentation was made by the DJ Enderly, the city planner and uh, lasted for about uh, 10 minutes uh, and there was uh, no opposition to this. So with that, we will close out the evidentiary portion of the public hearing, remand it to the council. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on to resolutions. Resolution 2024-04, resolution adopting an excessive force policy. Chief. 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 Oh. <laughs> so when DJ brought this to me, this really had, I really have no concern with this. In fact, this is honestly, I think it's less restrictive than what we were already operating under as far as um, state statutes and, um, and the policies and stuff that we have. So um, what's in here, and I know this is required for, um, for the development block grant that D. Lewis is talking about. So I, I have zero concern with either this one and as or the next one, because like I said, under um, uh, under our current state statutes, as well as our policies and stuff, they're way more restrictive than than what this is. This is just a, a basic that, hey, we're not gonna do this. Well, we haven't been doing it in the first place. So, um, so my question to answer was on the second one last, last council meeting, of, so it says, you know, you can't prohibit somebody from coming in and you can't let prohibit them from leaving. You know, what happens if they come in and say, I'm going to bring their cot in and they want to spend the night? So uh, can you say that again? Because I didn't need to understand. So this is on the second one. The right? second one, yeah. Uh, engaging in nonviolent civil rights demonstration. Right. Is right. that the one? And I, just, I mean, it seems like there's, it says you can't, you know, stop them from coming in. You can't stop them from leaving barring entrance or exit from a public facility. So if they come in and they bring their cot in and want to spend the night, then what? Oh, so so um, I see what you're saying. Um, so let me read through it real quick, Counselor. Um, Just assume there's, there's, at some point in time, you, you could politely say, or maybe semi-politely. So, yes, yeah, so this is talking about um, uh, failed um, prohibiting use of excessive force by law enforcement agencies within its jurisdictions against any individual engaged in nonviolent right. civil rights demonstration. Right. <laughs> the ghost came out. That was a demonstration. <laughs> that was a demonstration. So, yeah, so I, I see what you're saying, but so also uh, the way I'm, I guess the way I'm understanding it is it prohibiting use of excessive force by law enforcement agencies against an individual engaged in nonviolent civil rights demonstration. That doesn't say the way I'm reading that. That does not say that we cannot remove. Them. Yeah, you can still ask for them out. Absolutely, yeah. okay. for disorderly yeah. conduct or, or um, yeah. that there's there's a whole bunch. I actually brought up a bunch of different statutes here. Um, in fact, the state statutes on on use of excessive force, use of physical force. Um, there's um, there's one specific um, that I was actually going to bring up because I knew that would be one of them. Um, I mean, it even goes into like us reporting use of force, how we have to uh, report use of force. Um, then there's specific uh, statute for public buildings, trespass and interference. So uh, under, uh, under that, I mean, if you come in and camp here and say, well, we're closing, right? Well, I'm not leaving. Well, we we can move you. I mean, all the same is that we won't use excessive force to do it. 
But I mean, if we have to, you know, if they're passing resistant or whatever, we can still do that. Okay. So I, I have I have no concern. This one I'm making. Great question. That's great. Thank you. For me. So I need to read both these. No. No. So I make a motion to <clears throat> approve resolution 2024-04 resolution adopting an excessive force policy. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 2024-04 resolution adopting an excessive force policy. <clears throat> Is there any more discussion? Anita? Councilor Howard? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Councilor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Sabilla? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve resolution 2024-04, resolution adopting an excessive force policy. I make a motion to adopt resolution 24-05, resolution regarding protection of individuals engaging in nonviolent civil rights demonstrations. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve resolution 2024-05, resolution regarding protection of individuals engaging in nonviolent civil rights demonstration. Is there any more discussion? Anita? Councillor Howard? Yes. Councillor Lorenz? Aye. Councillor Watson? Aye. Mayor Pertem Sevilla? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries approving resolution 2024-5. Resolution regarding protection of individuals engaging in nonviolent civil rights demonstrations. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Now, resolution 2024-06, a resolution to adopt the Rio Grande County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you all for seeing me again. It's been several months since I've been here. We presented first back in October, but with the holidays and several things, and Gigi and I both being very busy people, we finally got back to where um, we gave you plenty of time to read the document. I'll look at it that way. And it is a very big document. There's a lot of information in it. <laughs> You're not going to read the whole thing tonight, are you? No, no, I'm not going to read any of it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I'm just asking for your approval of the plan and the approval of the resolution. And really just in the basics of what it does, it doesn't mention anything specific to Monta Vista, but as a county and an overall reaching county, it does allow us to work together, you as a city, myself as an emergency manager, and also the county commissioners to to identify hazards that need to be mitigated if there's something within the city that we can take care of, that we can find funding for, or that I can help you take care of, then that's what this plan allows us to do. It also allows us to um, recover and help recover uh, any funding or any um, resources after an event happens. And so, you know, if, if and when it happens again, we know that it will at some point, whether that whatever that may be, whenever our next bad day is, this plan would allow us as a county to, to help the city recover and recoup, recoup resources funding that kind of thing. So I'm asking you for your approval of that if there's any questions. Yeah, you know, I was looking through it. I you know I mean, mostly our risks are pretty low. I was a little surprised at, at the flood risk. Well, yeah, I agree. And I'm new to that. Area. I've been yeah. here for about four years. And I've uh, I've been the emergency manager through one um, well, melt-off season. Yeah. And when the river got to uh, to about 7,000 feet over in Del Norte and right. it was flooding over by Gigi's house, she and I had a conversation about it. I said, is this normal? And she goes, yeah. <laughs> she goes, yeah, this is normal. But I mean, honestly, I, I was in contact with Craig Cotton from the Water Resources Board and things, and he's like, hey, you know, we've got some flooding going on um, just north of Monte Vista. I wanted to make you aware. And so, you know, can we do anything about it? I'm not sure. Uh, but if there is something we can do about it, and if there's funding that's needed to, to get that, then that's what this plan allows. Do you have any sense of how much a risk, you know, what a dam, a dam failure would be? Or you know, I've, when I first came to the county, I went and talked with Tyler Off over at South Fork Fire Rescue to get an idea of really about the reservoirs and the dams and yeah. some things that are up in the high country. And and he said that the majority of the dams are very new, you know, relatively. Yeah, they just finished the San Maria not too long ago. We're doing that. Right, exactly. And so I, he he said that it was, you know, we look at risk as, you know, 
Is it going to happen? Probably not. Could it happen? Yes. If it does happen, the, the results would be devastating, you know, for a dam failure, depending on which one it was. But the risks are extremely low. Yeah. I mean, they're all front regulated. Yes. Federal, yes. Federal, mm -hmm. federal, federal, federal. Yeah, federally regulated. That's hard to say. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. I think honestly, our biggest risk, you know, let's all knock on some wood is, is wildfire you know, for this area. And not, not just wild land fire, but wildfire like you saw just a few years ago when like unfortunately Boulder and Marshall fire saw this last year. That's that's our highest risk in the year. Yeah. Not in Delmar area and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. not to hold it up, but it, in your table and your and your handout. You still have when they're listed in your position. Uh, yeah, actually, Gigi asked that question as well, and it was a, a list of who were the folks that were involved in creating the plan. And when the plan was created, Art was still the emergency manager. I came in right at the at the back end of it, so they didn't want to give me any credit for the work being done. <laughs> <laughs> and on the dams, the division actually has the flood. Uh, the dam inspectors actually do have the tables that will show where the if the dams were to merge, where where the flooding would occur. Yes, sir. Yeah, they do actually, and I think and, and Tyler showed me a few of those. And you know, as it comes down down the hill, and when it gets past Del Norte, when it really spreads out, is the land just and that's sort of and that's what when we have the flooding in Monta Vista and it gets if it gets past Del Norte, then it really slows down and spreads out. I would make a motion to approve resolution 2024-06, a resolution to adopt the Rio Grande County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 2024-06, a resolution to adopt the Rio Grande County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Is there any more discussion? Mm -hmm. Unita? Councillor Howard? Yes. Councillor Lorenz? Aye. Councillor Watson? Aye. Mayor Perton Sibola? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve resolution 2024 6, a resolution to adopt the Rio Grande County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Contracts, agreements, and leases. Street sweeper contract <clears throat> or to Neverest Equipment Company? Neverest. Neverest? Never rest. Never rest. Never rest. Never rest. That's what we're all doing. So we we advertised uh, RFP for a sweeper, and I did it with two things: one being a mechanical, and one being a regenerative air. When I was originally setting this up, I was thinking that a mechanical sweeper would be far less than what a regenerative air sweeper would be. Um, you can look at the table that's included in your packet. That's really not the case. Um, they're all pretty close. And for us, with the water and the puddling that we have, the regenerative air is far better for us. Um, so in front of you tonight, I'm asking you to award a contract to Neverest Equipment for a Ravo 5 sweeper. Um, I did go ahead and ask Nita if she could pull up a little video to show you um we like it for the following reasons one it's small it's compact it's made entirely in their factories which is here in us um it's a single engine operation it operates the the chassis as well as the actual um air th thing it has a moving broom head that brings everything to where the the actual um, suction is, and then it yeah. also is, it's a bummer. Okay. <laughs> so I have also have some literature there if any council members want to see it. Um, but it has a third front gutter room that will reach out like in our bulb outs on 160 and Adams, and will it's on an arm in the very front of the machine, and it can reach out and pull the material up to it. So um, it's not the cheapest machine and it's not the most expensive. Our budget for this was 350,000. So tonight I'm asking you to approve that Revo 5 Regenerative Air Sweeper 
for $323,988. And I would open it up for any questions. Is this the machine that you guys tried? Yes, this is the machine that we demoed. And that was part of the RFP. Um, and I went ahead and just kind of um, some other information for you. Um, the only two companies that responded was Neverest and Ferris Machinery. Um, they brought up a mechanical sweeper. It definitely did not do as well as the regenerative air. Um, on our deliveries, the Ravo is in stock. They have one sitting up in Denver, Cumber City, so we get it almost immediately. Um, the others can be anywhere from 75 days on the good end to over 250 days in the bag. So is this sweeper brand new? This is brand new. Brand how, new with a two-year warranty. How long is its life expectancy here? I would hope we would get at least seven years out of it, hopefully 10 before any major components break. And on those fan, it's the fan assembly that creates the suction that's what's going to take the most wear. So, and you say it's made in America? It is made in America. I like that. So, okay. and it's actually, oh, no, go ahead. It, it, it actually originated in Germany and they brought a factory it's in Chicago. That's where everything's. And it doesn't require a CDL driver to drive nope. it. Not perfect. Yeah, no what? CDL. It doesn't. Excuse me, it does not require a CDL license right. person yeah, to drive it. TG. Yeah, I don't yeah, see me out good. there. <laughs> I'm having a stressful day. You see me just cleaning streets. <laughs> Was able to get the video to work. So that front room with those horn and bristles are supposed to take out leaves. So yeah, that's pretty expensive. Uh, yeah, that thing's it's like it makes it all pretty regular, right? Yeah. So I have to hear it by that thing. Yep. I'm sure that's going to be a long start to show up here. With its own sprayer water system that you can spray down things. Really easy to use. It's on air. I don't know if you saw that at the very end. So the chassis is mm -hmm. air suspension, so you can lower it down when you need to or not raise it up to get over certain obstacles. And then, Rob, at this price, does it include um, on the ground training? Yes. On the ground training, it also includes delivery, which some of the bids did not include delivery to us, which is about a thousand dollars to get it down. But you had it in the budget, so it's actually I have not the cheapest one, but it's in budget. Within yes, budget. It is well within budget. Make motion to approve the contract as described. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the contract for the street sweeper. To award Neverest Never Rest Equipment Company. Is there any more discussion? You need them? Councilor Howard? Yes. Councilor Moran? Aye. Councilor Watson? Aye. Mayor Griffin Sibella? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve the street sweeper contract to Never Rest Engineering. Never Rest Equipment. Equipment, sorry. Thank you. Contract of will down for water meters and agreements to move forward with grant. Correct. So what we're looking for tonight, I'm going to have um, Chris and Scott kind of walk through the contract a little bit for you, kind of just touch on some of the highlights so you understand the scope of work, some of the different nuances in the contract, so you hear it from them. Um, we are asking tonight for approval with a delayed signing. Um, until we get our funding secure, um, GG has been in contact with DOLA and we're thinking we have plans that we can get most of the money covered through grants. We'll have to do a bridge loan to get the project going, but we don't want to do that until we have those grants in hand and ready to go. Um, 
So you know, you during the work session, they talked about the Water Smart Grant for 1.3, there's the Dola funding uh, that GD is looking at, the Mineral and Energy Impact Grant plus LOMA. And then um, we're also checking on the state involving loan fund because of their loans, there is some loan forgiveness. So I'll let turn it over to Chris and let him kind of talk you through some of the contract stuff. And then please, if you have any questions on the contract, ask it. Rob, did you still want me to put the contract? Yes, please. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Thank you for having me. Uh, again, Chris Gaddy with Build and Energy Solutions. Um, <clears throat> so we'll just dive in. Please stop me at any time. Um, essentially, I guess I'd like to re remind you that currently um, we are at the tail end of our investment grade, which is essentially in our process, a design agreement. It's just in the, the industry term. Um, and what we have here is what we would call our performance contract. So this is more geared towards the actual construction now that the um, all of the design work is done. Uh, what it essentially does is supersedes the old agreement. Um, so as I've explained um, in the past, but maybe not to everybody, um, <clears throat> the design agreement or investment grade audit was a contingent fee agreement. So if you move forward with this agreement, the amount of the dollar value of that last agreement just rolls into here. So there is no separate agreement at that time or any other dollars to worry about. So everything that we're talking about is contained within this contract. Um, <clears throat> so again, it kind of reads as you go through it as essentially a two phase design build contract. Just know that most of that design work has essentially already been done. Um, if you could scroll down, I believe, um, 4.1, a lot of this is sort of just boilerplate explaining the structure of the contract. Um, <clears throat> 4.1 is essentially where the dollar value of the agreement is listed. Uh, so essentially the cost of it will be $2,532,664. Uh, that is less than the amount that we showed you previously which is a uh, recognition of the fact that you guys have a uh, ex exemption to the state sales tax on materials. Um, so that is the total price, which then I guess I'd like to tell you about a little bit about what does that get you? So if you could scroll down, I'm not unfortunately sure what the page is. We're looking for the scope of work. Um, so I, maybe I could just tell you in the style. Um, it might be a few more things. Being a little picky, ESPC, I'm familiar with yes. EPC. What's the S stand for? Uh, so <laughs> energy savings. So EPC, ESPC, different states have different uh, governing legislation, which shorthands. Okay. All right. It should be just a little bit. <laughs> there, There is a lot. To the contract, but um, as you'll see, the scope of work is very detailed um, where most of the meat is. Uh, so, and that's just a form you can keep going. All right, uh, no, uh, here we go. So attachment A, uh, scope of work. Um, <clears throat> so again, if you're interested in the very, the technical specifics, all of it's gonna be for the most part located here. Um, you know, the general scope, this is all new meters, disposal of existing meters, uh, which will include separating the salvageable parts, uh, determining the value and crediting the city to that value back, um, install of what we call a cellular based, uh, advanced metering infrastructure system. So this is essentially a cellular attachment that goes into the meter, um, and, uh, commissioning training. Uh, integration with the billing system, everything to get the system up and running, um, and our continued involvement uh, with your billing team and operations team until, you know, usually it takes about three months after all in, uh, implementation is done, um, just to make sure that there's no issues with the billing data, right? It's it's very, very important that the data um, uh, integration into the billing system is pristine. Um, uh, Chris, I've got a question yes. there. So on the data side of things, how many years 
of data are we paying for in this contract? So um, the cellular system, uh, you, I guess you could think about it as two parts. There is the physical hardware, and then there is the, subs the data subscription. The data subscription includes um, the website. It includes unlimited technical support. It includes um, working with your billing pr system provider and integrating all of the data, um, as well as the actual cellular data to transmit things on a regular basis. Uh, to transmit data from the meter to uh, the portal. Uh, and that is for 20 years. So it's for essentially this is all designed to be a 20 year system. As you could, as you probably noticed, these systems technically continue functioning in the 40 years of age. Uh, they just don't necessarily function all that well. So uh, the 20 years, uh, especially with solid state meters um, and the cellular equipment, uh, with the 20-year data package, you have everything you need for those 20 years. And then is there a yearly maintenance fee on that or upgrade fee? or? There is not. Okay. No. So uh, they operate this as uh, essentially Aquahawk is the cellular uh, provider in this case. The, it's cellular portal. Um, and then the Aquacell is their mechanical or their cellular attachment. Um the uh, it, they operate it as a service model. So at, by subscribing to the data package, which you're purchasing 20 years of, it includes all upgrades to the system and everything along the way. And it, it's all done. It's essentially a website. Um, so this is a private cellular or public cellular? So um, it operates on uh, public cellular networks, so infrastructure, so Verizon, um, uh, T-Mobile, et cetera. And uh, one of the things we mentioned about this specific device is they're the only ones who have successfully put in a um, multi-chip, essentially, so they can, each device can determine which is the better tower network to put on for its specific location, okay. and it can make that change. Right, but they, so each meter reports to a tower, they don't hop or anything. Correct. Yeah, it, essentially it's a text message. And... and what frequency are they operating? So the frequency, the spectrum that they use <clears throat> is the same spectrum that a text would use. And so that's the spectrum that the government AT&T spectrum is. So it's, I'm oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so in, in what's unique about this? Your name uh, I'm Scott Griffith with Hold Hands, sorry. <laughs> Thank so you. So there's a gentleman here that knows all about 3G, 4G, 5G <laughs> in an amazing yeah, fashion yeah, right there. <laughs> so what this does, is this, one of the issues you have with AMI, and again, this was invented, you know, in my lifetime here and in our lifetime, and I've done a lot of projects without it, but this particular cellular scenario is really quite good. It's really, because it's using the text-based uh, <clears throat> frequencies so that it, like, you know, you can maybe get a phone call with the phone go through, but the text will. So that's one thing about it. It uses very low battery. It's very robust. And it also has a lot of redundancy. How often does it report? So what happens is in the meter itself reads every four minutes. You can then, it creates that data in a package. You can decide how you want that package. It can be sent every hour, it can be sent every six hours, it can be sent every three days. So and it's stored 100 hours? Is that what it's stored, stored 160 days. 160 days, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for instance, if a cell phone tower, this is why it's so good for out here, because the cell phone tower goes down, and you, it was a private system. You'd have someone out here over well, this way. I mean, they they come out and usually they're up and running the thing one a day or two, and it'll repopulate all that data. And and so to that, did you guys did Will Dan put in the meters in the town of Senna? Yes. No, no, no. But I kind of did. But I was part of the project back then. Okay. So I heard learned this today as well. Um, Whoever was their data provider when they paid for 10 years of data went bankrupt today and they no longer have a data provider. So, and I, I found out about that too. And so they bought actually 20 years of data. So there's a company called, they're in the transition right now, a company called Vintex that is taking over, it was called Smarter Technologies. It's not the system. And so they will be taking over and they will come back with that data package. Because I was checking it out too, because I, I heard about that about four years ago as well. Yeah, I they didn't go bankrupt. 
they went out of business. Smarter technologies have been used. Yes. Yeah. So this aqua. So aqua cell has actually been developed out of Colorado Springs. Oh, that's right. And uh, by generally by Charlie Whiteside, he sold a company called Silver Springs Networks for several hundred million dollars. So it's a very very robust team <clears throat> in uh, Colorado Springs, and so they're a very very reliable company. They've actually been in the software side of it for over fifteen years. Yeah, so that's something to note: is their their cloud portal actually can function with other cellular devices. Yeah. So their cloud portal, um, you know, has millions and millions of users currently, um, and that's essentially what the data package is for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I assume though you can export the data. Correct. To you can local servers if you wanted to. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, it's essentially Excel file type stuff, uh, CSV. Um, I have done a setup, so, and I am, so so I'm not in the software business. <laughs> there is the ability to localize if something happens. Yes, you could. Um, but the idea to... is that because both the meter and the cellular device store data for such an extended period of time and then use, you know, the networks that they are using. Yeah. You know, the likelihood of the cellular network being down for that long is very low. Um, so you can actually go up to a, a device and use your phone using NFC or taking a picture of a QR code on the device. Um, and it can take you to essentially a portal for that specific device where you can get additional information. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see, could you scroll up just a tap? Thank you. So uh, to start, um, the primary hardware is what you see in front of you. Uh, essentially, um, your billing system, uh, we believe that you know there's 1,979 of the 5.8 inch meter, which is a typical residential meter, um, and a lot fewer of the larger meters. Um, what we've proposed uh, here in this contract is the deal ultrasonic meter. So, um, for those of you that don't know, um, the old mechanical meters essentially gunk up over time. Uh, minerals and other things get in there, um, clog the device, and accuracy plummets. Usually for residential meters, that starts around the 12-year mark, um, and it can be substantial. And in the case of Monta Vista, your inaccuracy in the metering system is fairly high. Um, ultrasonic meters um, are what we would call a solid-state meter, kind of like a USB um, the move from uh, mechanical to solid state. Um, and because it's essentially a straight pipe without any mechanical element inside of it, it doesn't get gunked up and therefore lose accuracy over time. So that is the meter. Um, and then the aqua, the aqua cell, cellular endpoint, um, connects into those meters. Um, mm -hmm. And every single meter will have its own aqua cell. And every single meter has what, what they call the cellular data package and customer engagement portal. Uh, for 20 years. Um, if you could scroll down, um, <clears throat> I guess I don't want to uh, overburden you with detail at this point, but there's uh, a lot about the project planning and support. Uh, Wilden Energy Solutions is a turnkey provider. Um, so, uh, you know, this is to, intended to be done and, you know, to the extent possible, a single mobilization. Um, and, you know, we will work with your staff to schedule this um, in the way that's you know most uh, beneficial for the city operations. Generally, these things get planned to go in uh, during like along the same cycles that they read. So um, we do that. There's 24 hour answering service, uh, multilingual. Um, we have a communication strategy, a work order management system, et cetera, uh, to manage this process. Then if you can continue, um, there is uh, quite a bit uh, about uh, what we're talking here. You know, essentially, this is the removal of the existing meter and an installation of a like for like size. Um, in some cases, there may be so the five, eight inch, and three quarter inch meters are actually very similar specifications. Um, and in some cases, there may be an opportunity if there are some of those in the system that we're not aware of uh, to standardize. Um, to, to like size. Um, <clears throat> installation of 40% uh, of your system, uh, as we um, 
based on your uh, billing system, we assume 40% are in pits and 60% are interior. So also uh, described in this scope of work is all of the additional piece parts of pieces to do pit installations versus interior installations. Uh, the main thing is a pit, you need ideally an RF friendly lid. The reality is, is that we've put these cellular devices under cast iron lids and they've been able to get pretty good signal. Um, that said, you know, if you can get RF friendly, why not? It's better, much better um, in the long run. Uh, for those pits, it will include those lids, new plastic inner lids, uh, fiberglass rods to hold the endpoint up, um, et cetera. For the interior, it includes essentially an i cable um, for them to run it to uh, the edge of the interior of the property so that the signal can be get, get out. And also included in all of this is all of the installation work to do. You're doing that? Not me in oh, particular, yeah. but <laughs> I don't think you want me doing that. <laughs> uh, so there are really only a, maybe half a dozen major companies that do this on an ongoing basis at scale. It isn't your typical plumber job. And so what's the timeline then for, for 2,000 meters? How long will that be? Is that a three month? So uh, yeah, if not less, that's correct. So um, <clears throat> you really don't want to fall below 80 to 100 meters being put in a day. Um, it's just very inefficient for mobilization purposes. Um, and uh, so that would be the goal. Um, the tricky part in Monta Vista will be the 60% that are interior. We may have to schedule things. Um, so again, the installer, and that's included in here, the installer is responsible for um, working with the city on the communication activities, but also calling, setting up appointments, um, and managing that whole process. Uh, so uh, well, oh. will, will that not director actually do the water shutoffs, or is, is the city going to do that and then the contract will go? Good question. So yes, they will. Um, so the, the contractor will come in. Um, generally, we work with the city and, and we have in here essentially flexibility to communicate the way you would like us to. Uh, but generally what we do is in advance, we put out like a mailer with the bill, say, hey, this is coming. Then maybe a week before to three days before we put a door tag on. Um, and that's before the that specific locations installation. Then day before, and then they come in, they knock on the door, they make sure that there's no reason they can't shut it off for 20 minutes. They let them know, um, they give them a phone number, and if they can, they turn it off, make the change and turn it back on. 20 to 30 minutes on the rest digital side. Production. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> there are inevitably breaks in this case. So um, the pipes will sometimes break. Um, and so what we have included is a plumbing allowance in here. So, uh, and again, this will be something that we, you know, clarify with your staff exactly how, you know, what's the threshold of what they want us to deal with versus call them. Um, we'll always let them know. But uh, the idea is to have the parts and pieces on hand so that minor breaks can be addressed right then and there, keeping momentum. And making sure that somebody's not without water for any sake. Um, another note is I mentioned the meters themselves do have salvage value. The there's two, there's several pieces, but for simplicity's sake, there's two pieces we'll talk about. There's the salvageable part, and then there's what we call the register, which is the actual device recording the numbers of how much has gone through it. We will separate those two pieces and they will box and organize the register. Um, so the register is not useful for salvage. Uh, it is essentially at scale, we're collecting information about what the final read of the meter was. Records keeping, absolutely. So if, you're, if your residents have any you know, concerns or complaints, you have the physical device to reference back to, in addition to pictures and recorded in the work order management system. And you guys are just doing like recycling brass housing. Correct. Um, and then we'll, you know, uh, compile the value of that at the end and credit that back to the city, as well as any unused plumbing lines. Um, <clears throat> I think we can continue on. So the work order management system, this is a really important piece. Um, the work order management system is what allows us to do this at scale while maintaining pristine data. 
So again, I, I think I've mentioned in the past that a lot of cities where they fail implementing AMI is uh, the data integration into the billing system. So meters that may have been hand read for many, many years or visually read as we describe it, um, you know, when they take out a meter, they say, hey, this is the final read on it. It's had 100,000 gallons on there. They send that to billing. Billing puts that in. Well, the billing system says, hey, you know, that meter in our billing system should only have 80,000 on it. So the, the bill is going to be 20,000 gallons. And that's just a natural, you know, reality of the way that this infrastructure has evolved. So what we do is we flag that. And we provide all of that before it goes into the billing system so that the city can, can determine how you would like to act on those instances. Um, but there's a lot more to the work order management system to do that. They take pictures throughout the install. So in their 20 odd minutes. Um, yes, we've also interested about what we do for like commercial leaders, commercial groups, like how we call to make sure they were. Yeah. Right. So again, so, um, uh, the process for the installers when we're communicating, the installers are actually going to call all of the commercial businesses, look for times that work with their business to do it. Um, in some cases, that may be after typical hours. Uh, that kind of... um, <clears throat> so again, in the work order management system, they're going to record a host of things, existing meter numbers, final read, everything that your staff would record in a normal meter changeout, plus a few more items then that will be put into a large thing and combed through and bounced against historical data so that before anything goes into the billing system, we've sort of scrubbed it of any potential surprises. Um, so I think we can continue. Obviously, um, again, this is a turnkey process. So all training, um, integration into the system, et cetera, for your staff, uh, whether that's operation staff, billing staff, whoever, um, all of that training, everything's included. Uh, it isn't, it, the beauty is, is that it's not particularly complex software. Um, it's, like I said, it's a cloud-based, website-based portal um, that you can access on any device. Um, and then uh, we've excluded uh, sales and use taxes, et cetera. Um, and uh, then this excluded work will basically cover, you know, um, repairs or damage that would be outside of you know our scope of work etc uh replacement of angle stops things like that that are you know part of the typical typical process um i think then there's the plumbing lines i already kind of talked about that that basically you know again is to keep us moving quickly keep your your residents in good shape um <clears throat> but we want to do that in coordination with your staff on your exclusions Chris, it says um, repair or correction of any pre-existing code violations. Do you turn those into us if, if something's identified? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> so um, as part of this, we have, you know, quite a bit of project management involved. Obviously doing this at scale, you know, a couple of thousand times, um, there's a lot of oversight needed. So Will Dan has, um, Sort of the top layer of that project management is uh, a construction manager that is a Wildan employee dedicated to the city. Um, they will report to you every single week, if not more frequently, uh, depending on issues. So every week we'll provide a work order management system report that details out all of the issues that we've found, how much we've completed, anything like that, essentially in all of that data um, in one easy report. Every other week, uh, They'll be here in person to review that report to the extent that you would like them. Okay. He's the man. I have a, a one question I thought about after the last discussion we had. Um, what is, some of these people's plumbing's not really in compliance with what the meter specs require? Say, like enough plumbing before, enough plumbing after, stuff like that. To read. Does that affect your meter? Too much. I mean, I'm sure Rob, yours are probably the majority of. I'm sure you have already set up where they're reading properly. And... The the meters are reading. They're gonna find a gambit of different meters. Usually, in a in a perfect world, there is a meter setter, and the meter then goes inside the setter. Mm -hmm. We don't have that necessarily. 
there's going, is, so there's going to be some plumbing issues to where yeah, the plumbing that, setup is not plumbing allowance. So allow that them. will cover like if you have to change the plumbing to make sure that everything's within spec for that right. year. That yes, and up. and what we tried to do was a balance. So we recognize that we're buying, we're providing a turnkey price, which can then go get funded via different mechanisms. We didn't want to overburden it with, you know, eventualities that may, may, may never take place, but we wanted to provide enough buffer that we can continue. You know. okay, that's all I really want to know is if that incorporates it, plumbing needs to change a little bit in these houses to accommodate mm -hmm. a proper meter installation. So I know there's several of them that just, someone just shoved it in there. They're not proper. I mean, I run into it all the time in other places. So, whereas a meter, it's never going to read correct if it doesn't have enough after or enough before. But as long as you've accommodated for that, and it's not a, for a another thing that'll come up in the future or something like that. Correct. And and so, you know, I think it even mentions it in the language. The plumbing allowance will be used at, you know, in coordination with city staff guidance. And it's more or less so that we don't get customer owners or homeowners all of a sudden it's like, I shouldn't have to pay for this. I shouldn't have to do this or something for it. So it's like, no, we just go in, make it work and we're done. Right. Okay. And so, I mean, in, in large part, it is designed to go pretty similarly to how you would do, do one-off replacements and things like that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to create as little okay. um, change yeah, as possible. I'm just assuming that we'll get all kinds of homeowners complaining about their life-changing event of adding the meter, which I understand. I totally understand. But as long as we can make it as limited as possible. And much of the work, especially on the residential side, will happen during normal business hours. So it's very possible that a large number of people won't even really know, yeah. except for they'll have to throw their door tax up. Okay, good. Um, Chris, you want to scroll down? To the yes. Attack. Attachment B. So it's a performance guarantee. Yes. Okay. Um, so we'll continue on. Like I said, I, I we figure it's better to be verbose in the scope of work section. Um, so performance guarantee. The way this works, uh, this is the backbone of uh, you know this turnkey process. So um, <clears throat> essentially, uh, building one during the design phase we pulled meters out of the ground we sent them to a lab we we tested them uh, for accuracy in those isolated conditions so that we could determine the weighted accuracy weighted average accuracy of your metering system we then know and have you know there's obviously warranties with the meters for how accurate those are so we can determine um, a, essentially an accuracy pickup um, in this case, this section basically describes how that works. Um, it describes it, an increased access to billable gallons. So today, essentially, what's happening is you're sending somebody 10 gallons of water through the pipes, the meter's only reporting eight. We're going to make that up or part of it, or, you know, a large part of it. Um, so that's what this section does, um, and it essentially puts a dollar value to that. Um, and uh, this is what's covered in the Colorado legislation that allows for this whole uh, procurement process. So the performance contracting process. Um, <clears throat> and so if you could scroll down just a little, there's a table, I think a little further. Well, I know somewhere in here. Ah, okay, so essentially what it does is calculates a 9% um, improvement in uh, weighted average accuracy of the system. Um, takes you know your annual um, billable consumption, what has has been recorded, um, and then applies an, an increase in access to billable gallons. Value set at your rate structure um, for both uh, water and sewer, <laughs> and then that is what can then be used by you know the bankers maybe in in terms of a uh, bridge loan or some other type of financing to help underwrite the deal. Any questions on the performance guarantee? I should mention there's a measurement and verification service. So this is also required um, by uh, state legislation, which is basically, okay, we're going to provide you a written con contractual guarantee. So what? Well, the measurement and verification process is uh, where we have to prove that we are you're, you are indeed seeing an improvement in the accuracy of your metering system. Um, and to the extent if and to the extent that it is um, 
short of that accuracy guarantee, then Wilden has to make the city whole by writing you a check until it's fixed. So the idea <laughs> is somebody would be on the plan real quick. What's the inherent accuracy of the ultrasonic meters over the flow range? Can you say that again? What's the inherent, what's the accuracy of the meters over the flow, over a flow range? So uh, the uh, the solid state meters are 98 and a half or 99? Mm -hmm. We we put ninety eight point five because there's that cushion for you. They're they're ninety nine point nine percent accurate. They're very accurate because oh, they go, uh, overall flow ranges. Overall, uh, overall flow range. So that's the main difference. So especially low flow. <laughs> right. So when you talk about low flow, <clears throat> mechanical meters. So first off, that's the first thing that falls off in accuracy. Mm -hmm. They also only do to I think a quarter of a gallon versus an ultrasonic meter can can mm -hmm. read to a fortieth of a gallon. So that's probably maybe a little excessive, but the point is, is that they are far more accurate for low flow, which as you're probably aware, based on your questions, has seen, a, you know, is a, a much larger portion of the mix than it used to be. Um, so again, that's that's what this section uh, covers. So Chris? Yes. Councilman Howard missed the work session. So talk briefly about the 23 meters that we tested and the information that came back and why this is even extra important. Great. So um, I mentioned that it, during the investment grade audit, um, one of the activities we did was to pull meters out. Um, so we pulled 23 meters out. We actually put the, the equipment we're recommending in as a pilot demonstration, so we know it works. <laughs> um, so we took those 23 meters out and sent them to a lab. Um, well, without the data in front of me, um, I believe every single one failed on low flow. So they test them at low flow, mid flow, and high flow. And I'm pretty sure every single one tested and failed at low flow. Several meters weren't recording in them. Um, so, you know, what we did is when we looked at your overall gap between production and uh, consumption or build consumption, it was close to 20% gap which is a little higher than we see, but not a lot higher than we typically see for 30, 40 year old uh, visually read systems. Um, so not all of that is, is um, you know, obviously related to meter accuracy, but a significant portion, um, <clears throat> which all of that is what allowed us to arrive at a 9% guarantee. Number seven. Ah, okay, so um, the Colorado requires you to essentially do um, a one year and three year, uh, but I should say that again, it essentially requires you to do a measurement and verification process at one year and three years after construction. Some you, I mean, there is the option for you to continue on beyond that, but it does cost money to do the process and three years, you will know whether it is working or not. So we rarely see people continue on. Um, but there is, you know, this is essentially the one fee, um, you know, uh, that we would have out, outside of the typical process. Um, and that would be at year three. Year, year one would be included in the contract. Um, so again, that's for somebody to come and you know, do all of the research, pull the data, and make sure that we're meeting and produce the measurement verification report that meets state statutes. How long does that procedure take? Um, well, so we'll be collecting it for year one, not too long, because we'll be collecting data on a very regular basis from the system as part of making sure that everything is functioning accordingly um, and making sure that the billing integration is going well. Uh, I, I would say that, like, let's take year three as an example where it's kind of been a while and the dust is settled. We're probably talking about a month. Yeah, I would say uh, two weeks for the measurement time, and then two weeks for analytics. It's not. Um, and they may actually spot test meters. Uh, the um, the governor's energy office has certain paradigms. They want. Actually, meters are relatively new for them, so that we're trying to be extra careful in how we present that data. So, um, the other thing, I guess, 
This contract also talks about um, how all warranties are essentially going to pass on to the city. Um, so you'll get the warranties on the meters, the warranties on the cellular device, um, uh, warranty on the install, et cetera. Um, I'm trying to think. I believe that's the essential elements of the contract, unless you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Make a motion to approve the contract with Wilden for water meters and agreement to move forward with the grant with the late signing and funding sources being finalized. Seconded. And moved in seconded. <clears throat> to go ahead with uh, with Wildam for the grant for water meters. As Jason stated. <laughs> is, there, is there any more discussion? Just as far as the discussion on the finances, Rob and Anita and DJ and I met and and of course we're trying to get the loan down as low as possible. And so we reached out today. Um well, Randy Sneed and I have been playing phone tag, and she she's our representative for the Department of Local Affairs. And so she wanted us to, she said she'd call me tomorrow. They're looking at some funding called LOMA. That's a quicker process than the NREG manual impact. So she's going to check on that for us. And then um, she wants us also to check with Colorado CBD. Um, well, Colorado Water Conservation Board uh, for the loan. Um, Scott and Chris have given us a company to consider using. She thinks that the the dollar amount, their interest rate rather is lower, so potentially lower. So we're going to check into that. But then also because Monta Vista is considered a disadvantaged community, the Colorado Conservation Board has some loan forgiveness. So she said, let's check into that as well. So we're just trying to put some angles together. We had set aside 152,000 and some change out of our R funding. That'll go towards this. And then as Rob had discussed, take some out of our water reserve account. So. That probably did not get recorded. So oh. you've got to speak up. <laughs> I said that um, for our reserves, there's $2.4 million currently sitting in reserves. And I was thinking of using somewhere in favor of about 750000 for this project to make sure that we're forward. And hopefully, as we get grants, we can go less. So we're also working on the smart water grant for y'all right now. So that's actually due February 22nd. Uh, having this type of um, guarantee process actually helps us win those grants. <clears throat> so it's, that's a really good way to get it done. And so we're finishing up that now. We'll have some drafts to you next week on that grant. So we're working on that for you as well. And that would be valued up to half of the uh, cost of the project. Yeah, that one for the project. And that's a zero, zero recommendation. Zero rec but we won't hear on that for so quite a few months. So, unfortunately, it's if we're like, if we're, well, I think December because it is was so delayed this year. It was actually out. We were trying to figure we met you in July. Mm -hmm. We were hoping and it, and it didn't come out until very late November. And then they gave the normally uh, they're due in by November. This was actually, they gave us the end of February. So, that's why we're going to need a bridge loan <clears throat> to pre purchase everything. And then, like with DOLA, you can't go under contract uh, if you're applying for their grants. So we just need to make sure we, we're maximizing every opportunity we have. Okay. So get ready for your vote. You need a Councilor Howard? Aye. Councilor Lorenz? Aye. Councilor Watson? Aye. Mayor Proton Sibola? Aye. Mayor Becker? Aye. Motion carries to approve the contract with Wildam as stated by Council Lorenz. 
<laughs> Can we get that double on record? That's okay. By the eloquent. Thank you, Appreciate all your work on this. Very impressive. Thank you. Thanks for beating the snowstorm. So you were here. <laughs> I, I told you, if I had to go all the way around and get up your hands, <laughs> thank you guys. Right. Appreciate yeah. you being Very here. Nice. If you hurry, you can still go to Quincy's tonight. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tolerating all of our questions. Hey, okay. Very great. Thank you. Hopefully that helps you out a bunch, Rob. It should. It should help us out. Just to bring up the amount of manpower to be useful in us checking this. Staff proposal reports yeah. in action. Okay, City clerk. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I don't have a whole lot for you guys tonight. Just a quick update. Um, as of January, we have 259 open businesses within the city of Monta Vista. I have 133 that have renewed as of the end of January. I've sent out a second round of notices for renewals. Um, as of the end of this week, I have 34 new court cases. So staying pretty busy with the courts. I'm um, seeing a lot of traffic violations and unfortunately a lot of fighting and drug paraphernalia cases. Um, check out the Facebook page if you guys have Facebook. Um, our police department, some of our officers were out at the Sky High yesterday, the basketball teams and they were practicing with some of the basketball, some of the officers were practicing with the kids. So it's up there on Facebook and any chance we get, we try to get everything posted up on Facebook that the PD is doing or Rex doing, Kids Connection. That's it. Thank you, Unita. <laughs> Public works. Good evening, Council. It's been a while since I provided a, a written report to you, and we continue to be really, really busy. Um, as I stated last time, we are down an operator position and also the supervisor's position in the streets. Um, we are going to be interviewing for the supervisor here very shortly, and then we have the new hire for the streets starting on Monday. So we're going to get back up and running again. Um, you can read my report. Um, really, we're kind of doing some other things. We did get all five of the recycled plastic picket tables. They're currently sitting out at Chapman under the pavilion. If you guys want to take a look at them, I think they'll be a lot better than the ones we have. They're a lot heavier, so people won't move them as much. And they're recycled plastic, solid. Um, so it shouldn't be needing to bring them in, paint them, and do all the stuff that we normally do. Um, our big thing over in the utility side, which kind of goes with the meters, is there's a new rule that takes effect October of this year um, as far as the lead and copper rule. And that is an inventory of our distribution system, meaning services. Now the city, is divided into public service system, which is up to the curb stop and then a private service line that goes to the home. Under the new regulations, we have to know both sides. So Bobby started a program last year with the schools. So they're doing testing for lead in the schools now. Um, we've been testing, we don't have any lead so far contamination within our system but we still have to have an inventory. We did the initial inventory last year towards the end of 2023. This year, we actually have to go out and those unknowns we're gonna have to verify. Unfortunately, in our system, um, there wasn't good records when they put things in, so we don't know what materials. We know what years, and so we're able to 
take away some of them because of the year built. Anything after 1987 um, is no lead, so those don't, don't apply. So we've been able to do that. Um, we're working with the contractor 120 Water to make sure that we have the inventory as right as we can. And then we're gonna be sending our crews out starting here as soon as the weather allows, which is probably in the month. And we're gonna start excavating right at the curb stop and finding out what um, we have as far as what the, our service line is and what the private property service is. So this is be involved. This yeah. is a huge project. Yeah, I was thinking. Huge project, no funding to do it. Um, we are right now, hopefully, I'm not sure how much response we're gonna get, but we're gonna be sending out a, a mailer for those people that have homes that they might know what's underground if they're staying roof. You know, they lived there for 20 years and they, 10 years ago, they replaced their missing with power. So that's what we're hoping to get. So that mailer is going to be going out shortly as Megan's working on it right now. So um, shop, we're moving right along. We got, we did purchase uh, a, another truck for that. It's a heavier truck. It's a one ton Dodge um, gasoline that we can go out and haul trying to do hauling with either my personal truck or Dave's personal truck or some of our half tons doesn't really work. So we got a three quarter to our one ton, excuse me, um, to do some of that for us. Um, so it's good. Um, we are having some problems out at the airport with the plow truck. Um, it's not, it, it runs fine, starts fine inside. But as soon as we take it out to the airport and it sits overnight, it will not start. So we're working on that. It's not the glow plugs. Um, we're, we're still tracking it down. Um, we had it going today and then the radiator went out. <laughs> right before a brand new so. so anyways, we're looking at that. Um, as far as things that I'm going on, um, we are really, really busy. I'm acting street supervisor, trying to be the public works director. Um, we're in the process of looking at engineering firms for, to design the alley project. Um, I'm looking to order both a mosquito sprayer, weed sprayer, and get things going for summer. Um, we have some parks improvements that we're working on as far as the restrooms over at Chapman, trying to get those all fixed up. We have a few tour the city hall. I had my crews over here this week doing some initial demo so we could get those two rooms remodeled and done. Um, EOC, of course, at, at Sky High and ARPA funds for both the airport and the city. Um, so pretty busy. We also certified um, our streets. This is an annual certification that we do so we can continue to receive our highway users tax fund. Monies, which is about a, about 130, 140,000 a year that comes to us from gasoline tax. Um, and our certified thing is we have 29.498 miles of HETF eligible roads and 0.24 of non eligible. Those are actually maintained by the others. We have some county roads that we maintain, and likewise, they have some city roads that they maintain for us. So we don't receive them. So and with that, I'll open up for any questions you might have. Is there any uh, plans? And I know, you know since we talked, because somebody made a comment about the playground equipment. Yes, that's one of the things we're working on right now is there's roughly 49,000 that was originally dedicated from the ARPA funds for playground equipment. Um, we've had a meeting with DJ GG and staff to try to boost that funding up a little bit. We've got Megan and Xavier working on some different plans and some different things as far as getting some playground equipment in, looking at grants to see if we can take that 40,000, 50,000 and use it to, as seed money for bigger grants. So we're in the process of doing that. Um, we've got repairs going on that will take place in May at the tennis courts. Um, we're also looking at the pickleball courts over at Marsh. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a ton of things going on. 
but yes, we're we're going to concentrate. GD um, said we're going to prioritize Chapman since that's the heaviest used part to get that playground replaced. So that's kind of where we're concentrating a lot of our efforts and see if we get some other stuff going. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Chief, to be near long. Oh my gosh. I can't see. I almost fell. <laughs> I really don't have much. Uh, we've been, as you heard me say, we've been a little bit busy. Just um, just petty stuff mostly. Um, we've, uh, the last few weeks, um, there's a lot of funding that came available. So I've been writing grants like crazy. Um, I've just written grants for like I almost a quarter million dollars just trying to get um one that I'm trying to get is some new some more vehicles so that way we don't have to pay for them and then um brand new handheld radios and stuff so I've got the grants in for that and I, I should have a pretty good shot at it I think so that'll be good um promotions we finished our promotion process and um uh, uh Robert Pino and Josh Hill I think we're gonna do that on the 11th to make that efficient <clears throat> then the only other thing I guess we've got we've been we've done a lot in the last couple of years, three years, um, with the feds and doing a lot of federal drug cases, which is really good because we've um with those federal drug cases, you know, if you get sentenced to eight years, you get eight years. Uh, if you uh, I was having a conversation with the district attorney today and she was kind of like busting my chops for uh she's like, Why do you take try to take all these cases fed? And I'm like, Well, because if you take it federal, that's what they're gonna get. So if you get a 30-year sentence in Fed, you're going to get 29 years and, and nine months. And in the state court, you get a you get a 10-year sentence automatically. It's going to be down five to five, and then good time. You're going to so you get a 10-year sentence, you're going to end up with, I don't know, maybe three years out of that and if you're lucky. So these federal cases are are a lot um the, the federal systems are especially and we're we're not like taking everybody there, obviously. It's just the ones that are like like the big time. habitual or yeah, big absolutely big habitual big. they've got weapons and stuff like yeah. that in fact um we have one being sentenced from here uh next week in federal court um uh, atf hasn't given us what they expect that he's going to get and then we're going to do um we got grand jury next week in Durango to do some more indictments okay. that's about all i've got okay great thanks thank you it Good evening, Mayor and Council. I've been trying to keep this short and sweet as typical. But uh, this month has just been a lot of working on projects that we were previously working on in the previous months. So as you know, the PD gate was brought online or at least built a couple months back. We finally got that online fully operational. We had some networking issues in multiple locations here on the city hall side. We had issues over on the PD of computers not connecting in, live and fix. We had the entire phone system go down on us yesterday. <laughs> And that was brought back up within a couple of hours. Luckily, it wasn't any equipment dying like we initially thought. It was just the system being bogged down. And then over at Sky High, there was another network outage that had been fixed, and they are brought back up. Sky High has been approved for the second line. I believe it is there, ready to be put in place. We just have to get out there and get it configured. And then for the PD, we were installing a new program for them on the investigator PC and the, uh, I believe, now Lieutenant's PC for Mike Martinez and Zeke. The PD surveillance trailer documentation is finished, so the PD is now able to send that documentation out and use that for whatever they need, give it to other agencies and let them borrow it. We set the PD up for training in multiple locations as a couple of officers had training over in uh, PD training in Alamosa. We had to run out there and drop off a secondary laptop as one of the laptops would not take programs that they needed, so we had to run out there and drop off another one to get that configured. And then we also set Irene up for training over at Sky High. We finished hanging these Zoom bars over at Sky High, so all the smaller meeting rooms now have Zoom bars and PCs driving those behind them. So now they can be rented out for just like a quick little Zoom session or what we're gonna be using for, for that conference, we're gonna be having an overflow for the uh, banquet room. We had a couple of drive issues with the Sky High drive and the city website. Nita was able to track down some of those issues and that was just more or less just getting the website updated to take the new drive because we moved some files around. Sky High was having issues with the files disappearing. We were able to track that down, and those files are now back up in the Sky High drive with no further issues. 
And then we're doing ad conference tests. Uh, we are going to be doing an internal live stream for uh, the banquet room for the Wednesday event that's going on. As there is a live speaker there that is quite popular. So we just want to be prepared for that. So that way there's an overflow just in case there's any concerns of people not being a good spot. Other than that, it's just been continued security fixes and pushing patch, patches through for the city softwares. And other than that, are there any questions? Thank you, Christian. Thank you for what you do in the background. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No complaint. Thank you. <clears throat> well, city manager. We're going to think about the carpet. Yeah, here comes the big guns. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'll, I'll get close. Yeah, if, if uh, Rob's not spending it all on the street sweeper, then that goes for some carpet. <laughs> oh, a couple of things. Um, See you, George. Thanks, G. So we've mentioned this a couple of times the airport, and we've got two commercial businesses out there that does aerial spring, and they each have a above ground oil or uh, aviation fuel tanks that are out of compliance. And so Rob and Jean and I met with the um, inspector, his name's Alberto Villagomez, and in looking at the lease, they're because we, because the city owns the airport, we're the responsible party to be fined if, if this isn't taken care of. Within our lease, there was one little clause in there that it kind of gave Alberto the, um, felt like he has the authority to send a letter to these two companies from the state. So he's the bad guy versus um, us trying to deal with it. And so we'll be keeping you updated on it. It's, um, I don't know, what else to add? That's that. So it, it's kind of a mess. Um, one of the tenants is three years behind in his lease payment. So talking to Gene on what we can do to, um, get him to pay or, you know, what do we do to lock, shut him down? And, you know, what are the political ramifications if that happens? And so just got a lot of things at the airport to work through. Also want to update, uh, most of the leases come due at the end of 2024. They're 20 year leases. And so we need to uh, add things in there like an interest charge if they are late, an escalation clause to increase the the lease a little bit each month because you know they're paying 20 year ago prices. Um, out there, the city has two hangars and the rest of them are privately owned. So they're just leasing the land underneath. What does the city do with the hangers? They do private jet. So yes, that's how I fly around. <laughs> um, Chairman to the city hall. <laughs> yeah, the the two hangers is part of our contract with the gentleman who is our fixed based operator, Jed Ellithorpe. So whatever he rents them for, he gets that income because we don't we don't pay him a flat salary every month, and and he does a lot. He really helps take a lot of pressure off of our public works department. And one of them is not in really very good shape. Um, DJ and I went up today to um, Del Norte at, to a work session with the county commissioners on the hotel project. They have some concerns over the incentive package. They just didn't want to do a, a similar incentive package is what the city has done. So um, the developer is going to be back in town on February the 13th. And so if Gene wants to join in, uh, their attorney is going to be meeting with him and trying to get some of their questions addressed. 
So it's come to light a couple of things. It's kind of weird sometimes how things happen. But the Faith Hinckley Veterans Memorial Park has never been completed as far as what the original scope of it was. Scope of it, yeah, the, all of the extras. Nor have the, they had collected money from like 250 people to have bricks set, to have a brick walkway. So um, Mr. Glass has not started on those yet. And so he wants to sell his business and um, has told us that the bricks were are, are all paid for, but the engraving is not. So we need to get a hold of the Monta Vista Community Fund, find out how many how much is in there, get those engraved before his business potentially sells. And then um, Larry Gardner, some of you may recognize his name. He goes by Animal. He's been instrumental in hosting a lot of, of the car shows. And so we're looking at hosting a, um, a, a car show or a poker run. I'm not exactly sure what all it looks like, but it'll be uh, the weekend of July the 27th, which is traditionally Stampede. And since Stampede's been moved up two weeks, nothing else right now is, you know, everyone stays away from Stampede dates. So um, he wants to do a fundraiser specifically for the Veterans Park. And um, so hopefully we can get a few things done. And I've got an idea of a grant we can, uh, or a foundation we can go to and maybe get some funding to help finish that off. It's about as exciting as watching dry paint. Um, but there is a property tax listening tour that the state is putting on that is Saturday at 10 o'clock at McDaniels Hall, if any of you want to go down and listen to that. Commissioner Lori Lasky is on that commission, so that's great. We've got someone from the San Luis Valley and, and a rural representation on there. And then you're invited to, um, to lunch on February 14th. We're going to do a chili cook-off. And so come join your employees and have a little lunch and that's it. Okay. I, so, so thank you all for taking my tour. <laughs> uh, with the renditions that uh, we're doing to open up those hallway, that hallway to make space for the um, public works and community development uh, departments. We would like to replace the carpet in the hallways and down that hall, this west hallway and the carpet, uh, the offices in those areas. Um, last year, we did have, had, we had two bids and so they've already been measured once so I'd like to go back to both of those companies and it's Del Mar and Wright Carpet and see by not doing the whole um, building, what that would potentially cost and, and get that replaced. Okay. So thank you, Councilman, for bringing that back to my attention. <laughs> thank you, Gigi. Yep, thank you. Council Committee, City Commission, Council Reports. Councilor Watson. Say that again, what am I doing? <laughs> you just volunteer. No, it's a council. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, what? Do <laughs> you have anything you want to no, oh, no. Since I didn't know I was going to do the turn. <laughs> Councilor Howard? No. Another time? Okay. Council Lorenz, as so stated. Victor? Same thing there. Monty Strong, we will recess till February 15th at 6 p.m. here at Council Chambers. Oh.
I swear Austin picked himself a link. It's like, wait, what? What is it? 